need to take this round and yes, finish him right here. Yes, sir. Put the pressure on him, get him on the ground, and finish him. He's tired, just like we knew he was going to be. This is your fight, Carlos. Go and get it. I mean, who doesn't need more safe Saud in their life? They're going to stop the fight. That's it. Yeah. Justin Gaethje yeah. stops yeah. Tony Ferguson in round five. Um, it's not about winning or losing for me. It's about not disappointing myself, my family, and representing God to the best I can. Justin, the Highland Welcome to UFC Unfiltered. Please tell me that's on video. I've never been happier. I'm made for a fucking podcast. That's dangerous! Listen to me, we're at it! Welcome to UFC Unfiltered. Matt is, I don't know where Matt is today. They never tell me where Matt is. I'm assuming he's with the boss. Uh, so Megan, thank you for uh, jumping in and, uh, and hanging out with us for, for today. Oh my gosh, it is truly my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we have Safe Saud and also Justin Gaethje, which... Uh, um, we had Justin on last year. He's one of my favorite guys to watch. Like, I really love watching him fight. I mean, how can you not? The human highlight reel is the most accurate depiction of who he is. And also, he's one of my favorite athletes to talk to because he takes things to this real honest level that sometimes maybe people don't want to do an interview. So I, I truly, genuinely love talking to Justin. I'm so thrilled to be able to fill in on an episode where he's a guest. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I think last time Safe was on, I wasn't here. I think I was away and, uh, and Jens was the co-host with Matt, I think so. One of us is always traveling for something. But for him, see, his job is safe because he's traveling for UFC. When I'm traveling for stand-up, I mean, that's not, that's not UFC business, so I don't get paid. Yeah, but it's still pretty awesome, so we'll allow it. For me, it is. For the audience, it's terrible. <laughs> for, the, for the ticket goers who want their money back, it's a... And, and I spent today... Now, you, you guys own a home, I'm assuming. Yes. So it is, I'm doing my windows are leaking and I've been obsessed with my leaky flooding windows. Is there anything worse than things in the house that don't work? Oh my God. And speaking of leaking and flooding last week, I got up pretty early. It was around 6 AM and I went out to the living room and I was like, oh, that's weird. Did Joe start taking a shower as soon as I left the room? Ah. Like I hear some water running. About three minutes later, I'm like, where's this water coming from? It's not Joseph. I look, there is a geyser coming from the side of my house, almost three feet high. A, a water line broke and was just shooting everywhere. It was horrible. Wait, was it outside or inside? Outside, thank oh, okay. God. Because two years ago, our hot water heater exploded and flooded the inside of our house. So it's just leaks and water damage are like my biggest fear right now. What a nightmare. <laughs> it, it's, it's so crazy. I'm 53 years old and I'm afraid of the rain. Like I'm obsessed with when, when you see the water starting to leak through, isn't it a weird, like you can't stop water. Water's going to find a way. And it's really terrible uh, how helpless you feel when your place is leaking. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things until it's happened to you, you don't actually think about water as that damaging. You're like, eh, it's water, right? It yeah. dries. It's not like that at all. I mean, speaking of, were you guys hit hard by the storm or, or how'd that go for you? Well, I have, uh, it's funny. I was away. I have tarps, my windows, I tape tarps to my window. It's, it's awful, my kitchen and my living room. And I didn't get a drop of water during the storm. It was leaking during the last storm, like three weeks ago. This past one, which was, you know, like the revelation level, uh, nothing happened. I didn't get a drop of water in my house. Wow, okay, well, well, we'll take that, right? I had a window guy here. I got people on my terrace doing stuff. I, I'm not domestic. I'm not good at doing this stuff. Like, I just, I need to ma marry a person, uh, whoever that person is who is good at being an alpha around the house, because I suck at it. We both do. We just have to hire people to do everything in our house. <laughs> That's kind of what I do, too. I just have people who are really good at what they But is there anything that you like? Like, the window guy was here before, and literally, when, when someone can come in and tell you how to fix something that you feel helpless with, it really is. You do develop a hero worship for people who can fix windows and, and, and stop flooding. Yeah, there was a guy who came in for our, our um, fireplace one time and he said something that Joe and I use all the time as a saying. He said, we all do what we do for a living and for the rest, we rely upon others. And I'm like, that, yes, that's exactly it. We, I just talk for a living and I rely on everybody else for all the other things in my life. Yeah, but I also talk for a living. And when I watch you walking, I told you everything I talked to you, watching how you give those fighter bios and, and the information, you give a lot of interesting information. It's not just uh, his last fight was a knockout. Like you give real info 
while they're walking, you time it perfectly. You're never stuttering. It, it amazes me every time I see you do it because I trip over everything. Oh, thank you. I mean, hopefully I can just continue to do more and more because I do think they add value, especially to people who maybe don't know a person's story as much. It gives you a reason to care a little bit more than just fighting statistics, which are obviously important. But the bio is is always something I love to be able to do just a little bit of deeper digging. And and like I said, how I would want people to know my own husband within the sport is how I right. try to present it. What's up? How you doing, man? I'm good. How about you guys? Okay. Uh, we're just complaining about flooding and leaks around. Are you handy around your house? I mean, you're such a killer, but are, are you good at fixing shit in the house? No. No. <laughs> Makes I mean, us feel less I, bad. No, but I got friends. I have really good friends that are really good at that stuff. I guess it helps, right? I, I, one does HVAC, so I got pretty much everything taken care of. Uh, the only thing I take care of is all the flowers in my yard. Oh, you're good at the, you're good at gardening. I'm okay at gardening. I, I lost one. You're supposed to lose twenty percent. I lost one plant, so out of like I don't know ten. That's not bad. Better than average. Do you find it peaceful and relaxing? Is that like a place you go to kind of clear your head? Well, like when I get home from practice, I usually go out there and I like to see all the. the I got bees and butterflies all day, just moving around in there. So that's cool to see. I love that. Justin Gaethje, this absolute killer, likes watching yeah. the bees and butterflies. <laughs> in my first house, uh, so, and it's brand new. So there's not a lot of things I've had to fix, uh, but you know, it's all a learning process. I'm sure, you know, hopefully 10 years from now, I'll be pretty good at fixing a lot of things around the house. Yeah, do you get freaked out by bees? Like, I, I literally hate anything that's flying or fluttering or buzzing. It really freaks me out. You can just kneel in the garden and work with bees yeah. flying around. I used to actually, what if you asked me what I was scared of my whole life? I would now it's flying, but it was flying in bees. Uh, I don't know why I was terrified of bees or anything. Wasps, when I was up, I used to paint houses and wasps would they would they would just mess with you on purpose. I don't know what that was all about, but they were they were good at it. But no, when they're in my garden. Uh, no, I feel like they know that, uh, you know, that they're my friends, so they're not going to, they're not going to try and fuck me up. Oh, okay. You, you, so you don't panic when you see them? No, no. Yeah. I think, uh, they're like, I, I've learned they're like dogs. You don't freak out. They don't freak out. That's fair. Maybe, I, or probably not true, but seems yeah. like it. How do you deal with this fear of flying? Because in your line of work, Justin, you, you've got to fly a lot of me. You're going to fly to New York for your fight in Madison square garden. Um, Xanax if I have an option. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just sit there and I don't know. It's, it's, it's all in my head. So statistically, you know, I'm pretty safe. But it only takes, you know, there's a lot of human error that can happen. I don't know, just flying through the air and a piece of metal. The more I think about it, it doesn't make sense. It freaks me out. You know, it really, for many years, I, I was terrified of it. And then I kind of got better with it. And now I'm a little more nervous about turbulence. Um, I, I have to fly too. Do you ever drive when you can? Like, will you take, like, if I can take a drive six hours or under, I'll do it as opposed to flying. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm weird. I'd rather just take a Xanax and fly, I guess. <laughs> Did you always have the fear? I don't know if it helps everybody. Like it helps me, but I'm serious. Oh, yeah. Like it can freaking when I went to Abu Dhabi, dude, like I fly to, I went to Brazil, went to Morocco. You just get on the flight, you eat your dinner and breakfast, and then you're there. It's crazy. <laughs> Everything, you know, sleep for 11 hours in between. It's nuts. But I have to do it because the whole time I'm like sitting there freaking out. I'm like, all right, three, two, one. All right, we're good. We're good. We're good. Yeah. Stupid. Did, did it develop or did you always have the fear? No, I used to love it. I used to, as a kid, I'd be like, if I don't get butterflies, it's not worth it. But older and wiser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. No, I, I actually kind of feel like that as well. I mean, I, I don't take anything, but I used to really love flying and think it was a fun adventure. And now I'm, I'm pretty yeah. terrified, which sucks because I fly all the time, especially when I work UFC and NFL. It's flights every weekend. But Yeah, you fly 10 times as much as me. So. Yeah, it's a... It's, a, it's, a it's the company, game. you know, like people even pilots they freaking get on a plane just to go to work to fly to a certain airport i'm like you guys are fucking crazy there's no way <laughs> there's no way 
Is there anything worse than when you're flying and it's a little bumpy and the announcement is, oh, we're going to ask the uh, flight attendants to be seated. You're like, oh, shit, this yeah. is going to be rough. Yeah, we're going to we're going to sit down early. Uh, we're going to start, you know, yeah, taking the drinks, put everything away early because it's going to be a rough descent. Pilot asks us to sit down like, oh, great. Yeah. I hate like when you're mid cruise up 35,000 feet and they're like, um, all right, sit down, put your seatbelt on. It's going to get bumpy. And they're just yeah. waiting for it. It's like, oh, shit. At 30, you're not supposed to get bumpy at 35,000. No, it's a terrible <laughs> loss of control. Like it's, a, it's, I think it's a control thing. Like it's, it, it, you, you're not in any less control with anything in your life than you are when somebody is flying you somewhere. That pilot can freaking go up and down, up and down and kill everybody in the back in minutes. Like that is, I mean, you shouldn't, like you shouldn't think about that. <laughs> no. <laughs> that shit happened in the past. I mean, that has happened. Yeah, well, well, you're gonna take a plane to New York City to compete yeah. at Madison Square Garden. The right in the right state of mind and really wants to get there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> I've I've got to imagine that uh, it was exciting to hear MSG. Obviously, the matchup is great with Michael Chandler, but is there something for you about that arena that that you know makes it more enthralling than maybe somewhere else? Oh, I think I really need to uh, embrace it more. This isn't. I fought. I fought in the theater at Madison Square Garden on New Year's Eve. Um, at the end of 2017, 2018. So that was that was an experience. You know, I got that whole experience. It wasn't in the theater, you know, in the big arena with all the fans, but now I've experienced that with other UFC fights. Um, so I think, yeah, I think when, you know, in hindsight, when I'm older, I think it'll be something that, you know, I can share with my either nieces or nephews or kids or grandkids, whatever, you know, as far as I get in that department. Um, they'll, they'll always you know, be something to talk about. So, yeah, and it's a great card. You know, got two teammates on there. You know, my coach has three three athletes in one night, so it'll be a special night. Yeah, um, you you must be looking forward to fighting in front of fans again. I mean, how long since you actually fought in front of people? It's It was before the Ferguson fight, right? Yeah, it would have been, yeah, Cerrone. Cerrone. Yeah, it sucks. I mean, that is definitely the, the what I'm most excited about. I think, you know, that uh, that atmosphere is something – something special and it's something where I really, you know, have embraced, I'm a show off, you know, a performer. So I think that part really, you know, plays good, plays well for me, you know, and being in front of people, having people, and there's always, I always know that there's a million people watching, millions of people watching on TV, but it's just not the same. No, it's, it's right. very true. And we hear that from a lot of our athletes who have competed, you know, in kind of this fanless atmosphere. Um, but in, in terms of the fight itself, I mean, what do you like the most about facing Michael Chandler? Oh, uh, you know, I think uh, before he fought, you know, Dan Hooker, you know, coming from Bellator, you know, there wasn't a lot that he brought to the table. But now, you know, with, you know, knocking Dan Hooker out, having a, a great fight against Oliveira, you know, he's kind of proven that, you know, he, he belongs here. And ultimately for me, I need one win to fight for the title, to fight Oliveira or Poirier. And that's that's my goal. And this is a huge fight. This is a dangerous fight. Um, he's super explosive, you know, athletic. He's dangerous, but I think it's a great matchup for me. I think at the end of the day, I think stylistically, you know, we see so many different types of fights. I think it's a great fight. You know, he says the first one to take a, take a step back is a timid soul, uh, you know, there's not one thing he can say that's going to, you know, affect the way that I approach this fight or the way that I approach, you know, I will take a step backwards. He can shove, you know, shove it up his ass. What's where you're going to see a timid soul is when I start kicking him and he's going to start shooting for legs and trying to wrestle. Um, and that'll be, you know, his definition of a bitch hundred percent. And that's what we'll see. I believe, I think that that's what we'll see, you know, midway through the first round. So you think, interesting you said that too, not taking a step back, you're not going to let him affect what you do. Do you think sometimes guys do that where they'll make a comment almost to challenge somebody else's ego and get in somebody else's head to, to try to direct the way you fight your fight? Yeah, 100%. I mean, 90% mental, 10% physical. I mean, Conor McGregor, you know, some of his success um, was his ability to make people fight certain fights, you know, not necessarily Jose Aldo. Jose Aldo didn't go out there and fight Jose Aldo's fight. He was no. angry. You know, he was emotional. And if, if you're fighting emotional, you will not win. You know, you will not be your best. Um, as 
as much as it's like such an emotional like experience, you really have to be void of any emotion um, in the fight. So yeah, I think, and then my number one rule is never let somebody affect my thoughts or emotions or, you know, or the way that I process my feelings or whatever, however you want to put it. And yeah, he's not going to determine how I fight. You know, I, I fight a certain way um, and every fight's different. So I'm going to fight this fight a certain way. My coach is going to tell me how that needs to be done. And I'm going to work, work hard to be ready. You mentioned the Aldo fight. And if I remember correctly, I knew there was something he was in his head because before that fight, during the face-off or the weigh-in, Jose did something that he did, doesn't normally do. I think he postured a certain way or he mocked the way McGregor stands. I don't remember what he did. At the weigh-in. Right, it was the way. And I remember yeah. thinking that's not how he usually is. The, McGregor has changed his thinking about something, and that's not good. No, no, that's that's a recipe for disaster, especially, you know, you have to be in control of everything in there. Um, preparation is the number one thing, and he had control of that, but, man, you know, you cannot let these guys affect you. This is this is mental warfare um, at the end of the day. This is what he's trying to, you know, partake in or get started. Um, you know, he's been knocked out. I've been finished two times, tapped out once, or not tell yeah, whatever, tapped out, got choked out. Um, you know, by elite competition, yeah. by the most elite competition. And, you know, he's been knocked out by less than elite competition. At the end of the day, I have to talk this man up because he is so dangerous, so explosive, and so athletic. Um, and he has a great coach, Henry Hoof. You know, this will be, the I think, the third or possibly the fourth time that I've fought against Henry Hooft. I uh, haven't lost yet, but, you know, <laughs> they're very smart, you know, and every experience where I'm in there and he gets to be that close and watch me fight, you know, they learn certain things. So, you know, I'm sure that he thinks he has better answers than, than the previous times we fought. And he probably has his best athlete that has stepped in there with me um, than the previous times we fought. So it'll be interesting. You mentioned Henry, who is a phenomenal coach and just human being, but so is your coach, Trevor Whitman. Um, like you mentioned, a very busy night. It's you and Rose and Kamaru all competing on this card. But when you talk about the, the kind of approach, and not just in terms of a game plan, but the mental approach and not letting things bother you, I mean, how much influence does Trevor have on that type of scenario in your life? Uh, I mean, I think this is something I came to Trevor with. Um, I really... I think this is something like a skill that I've honed through wrestling, through wrestling for, you know, from four years old till I was 22 years old, you know, have a twin brother, you know, all that stuff. Um, you learned early to not let someone affect, you know, your emotions. You have to be in control. Um, the brain is such a powerful, powerful thing. And if you let someone trick you into a certain train of thought, then it can be, you know, detrimental for a day, for a week, for a month or for a lifetime, you know, depending on how much, you know, how much you can understand you're being affected. But that was just something I learned early. Uh, I think in life, that's important, you know, especially if, with the ability that I have to like cause violence and create damage in like a one-on-one -on -one bodily situation. If I was out in the public and I was, you know, allowed people to, to set me off or take control of my emotions, then I probably would be in prison already. So. You know, I think that's an important thing. I don't ever want to hurt somebody, especially because they, you know, because I wasn't in control. That would be, that would be something I would regret for a long time. Have you had moments like that where, uh, and this is coming from a guy who can't fight. So did, have you had moments like that where you, somebody you know wants to be confrontational and you realize that you're saving them by kind of walking away? No, I just really avoid, like, I won't even let it get to that point. I mean, it's, it's like I've been set up. I'm petty. Like I've been known, like I could be petty and there's certain small things, you know, like you picking on someone else, then I will, then, you know, then it's game time and I won't back down. And, you know, in certain situations like that, I have been there, but it was always when someone was the aggressor and taking advantage of someone that was less than or less, you know, couldn't, couldn't pr protect themselves. Those are the only situations where I've ever been, you know, almost lost control, but, you hate a bully outside. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Outside that, like I've been punched at a party and I was like, you know, you hit like a bitch. 
<laughs> no, I, I wasn't sure. There was there was like six of us and like ten of them, but we were all wrestlers and we had our heavyweight. And he was crazy, so I really thought that someone on their side was going to get either we were going to get hurt or they were going to get seriously, seriously hurt. So that that was the one time I was like, "Nah, we can't lie. We got to avoid this." Because we were in, we were in college, you know, and I'd already been in trouble for a fight that I wasn't even really part of. So I was like, "Nah, we got to we got to avoid this situation." But it was like a forty year old dude at a college party. Yeah. And he, yeah, it was crazy. It was, and he punched me. I was like so surprised to see this man. At this party, and it was just crazy. That was a fun night. College is a crazy time. Yeah, crazy. I didn't go. I dropped out of high school. I wanted to go to be a lawyer, but uh, I dropped out of high school and, and never quite made it. Oh, uh, were you, were you good in college? Uh, aside from that, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a. I came from a small place. Went to Greeley, Colorado. I mean, it's no one is a small place in in general, but for me, it was a huge city. Um, you know, I had strict parents. So I never was able to stay out past like 11 and then I got to college and I could do whatever I wanted. And so, you know, there's, a, there's good and bad things when it comes to that. So yeah, I was good, but it definitely took a year to, to really learn some things. I was ineligible at the end of my first year. Let's just say that. Oh, Justin, were you? <laughs> Halfway between my, cause I thought I was smart and I didn't have good advisors. They put me in, I was in statistics my first year, my first semester, like that is absolutely not something that should happen. I, I should mean, have been statistics. It's like an advanced, like I wanted a criminal justice degree and they're like, oh, you gotta see, take st st statistics. I was like, well, I'm good at math, let's do it. And they're <laughs> like, all right, cool. And they threw me in there. And then I was like, wait, well, this is not math. This is formulas and, and you gotta remember, just memorizing formulas and learning how to use mu. Like I still don't even know what mu is. I took a whole class. Yeah, I, I bombed miserably in problems and statistics. I, I tried to get my high school diploma college credits. I went to like a community college, which would like transfer both ways. And uh, yeah, problems and statistics was a miserable, miserable class for me. That's rough. I'm the outlet. Was, um, I loved stats. I thought that was, oh, I took it in high school loved, and in college. I loved it. This is how bad I was. At the end of the year and the final, the teacher was like, take it home, bring it back. And I'll pass you. And I was like, and I was like, I do not deserve it. Like I took it home and I was like, I, I can't do that to like just and I should have done it. That was a dumbass move. But I was like, I can't do it. I know nothing. I like I sat there in the class and I knew nothing. And so there was no way. I was like, I just gotta move. That's why I went to you know human services, because you didn't have to take stats. No, oh, wait, out for you. Yeah. I might have yep. asked you this before, Justin. I don't remember, but but you, you said uh, criminal justice. You were you wanted to be uh, be a lawyer at one point. Is that what you were going to do with that? I mean, I'm a great, I'm a great liar. Not, not a great liar. I'm a great um, oh, debater. I mean, I could, yeah. I could argue my way out of a web, you know, out of anything. You yeah. know, my mom would always tell me that I should be a lawyer, but hell no, I can't go to school for that long. You kidding me? I could be, I couldn't get past statistics. You want me to get my law degree? <laughs> no, no, I wanted, I don't know what I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to work in the same field. I was thinking, you know, police officer wasn't at the top of my list, but more like probation or, you know, somehow to catch, catch the kids before they're in the system was always my goal, you know, but then, so human services really was probably should have always been number one for me, but yeah, I thought, I, you know, I thought with a law degree, not with a lot of you with the with the criminal justice degree, not a lot of degree. I would be able to, you know, move, you know, any anytime you have, you know, you go into the military, you have a any kind of bachelor's degree, you're straight to an officer. Right. You know, a bachelor's degree really does help you in, in a lot of different ways. Um, if you're trying to, you know, start a career and move up the ladder. I mean, that's ultimately you it's a necessity. You wanted, you still want to do social work though after your fighting career, correct? Yeah, I mean, I ultimately I'm doing social work. I mean, every I get messages all every day from all over the world um, about you know inspiring people. You know, I take every opportunity I get to work with vets. Um, I go home and work with kids. You know, ultimately I'm using it, and I'd say more effectively than ever if I didn't fight. If I just wanted to go that route and stuck with that route, I don't think I would have been as effective you know obviously with the platform that i've gained these kids they just listen more i don't know why um but yeah i have more influence than i would have had if i didn't sure. uh, fight yeah i'm still doing it 
um, I think every day, trying anyways, trying to be an example at least, you know. But yeah, I think I I, I do a lot of a lot of different things. Did uh, you often? Did you think at one point this fight wouldn't happen? I know they were ta- asking about Michael. Would, would you fight about vaccinations and all this? Were you concerned like this fight is not going to happen? And then was there one point where you thought like, okay, now we have to look for someone else? No, I thought he was just seeking attention. I mean, at the end of the day, that's private information for one. Like, I don't even, you don't even need to talk about that because Dana White's going to handle it. Um, you know, I was going to fight Tony Ferguson in California, you know, in two weeks before that ESPN, Disney all freaked out. And we went to Jacksonville. I knew for a fact that I'd be fighting November 6th. Um, I didn't know where. But now I think it's going to happen in New York. You know, they have a law in the books. It says if you're, you know, a performer or an athlete coming from out of state, you don't have to be vaccinated. So that takes care of the issue right there. Yeah, that that roundabout rule. We were just talking about that at the office a couple of days ago. If you are a New York native, if you live in New York, you have to be vaccinated to compete in New York. But if you do not uh, and you're coming in, I believe, I believe, and don't quote me on this, but I believe it's the same for fans that they can come in as well from out of state if they're not vaccinated. Again, I can be totally wrong, but I believe that's what we went over. I'm going to look it up. I haven't heard that, but that would be interesting and and definitely some good information. Yeah, yeah. Well, you wonder if it's venue to venue too. At at the end of the day, they would have no concerts. You know, not none. There's obviously performers and stuff that have been vaccinated, but if half haven't, then those half, you know, you're losing out on concerts. We'll see. We'll see how much. They don't want to lose. They can't lose enough money. You know, it's, it's, there's a certain dollar amount they can't lose. And once they do, we things change real quick. So I think we're on the way there. And after the the fight with Habib, obviously, like you said, he's top level. I mean, you, you can't get any 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 better than he is. How how was your mental state after that? Was there was there a period where you were you needed time to yourself, or did you did you go through self doubt, or what was that like for you afterwards? Yeah, I mean. Uh, this was a different, you know, it was, a, it was different, different experience than I had ever, you know, really experienced. Losing to Dustin and Eddie was different than this one. You know, those ones, this one hurt, but it was, I don't know, man. I mean, I gave, I gave everything that night and, you know, he is great. And then with what he was fighting with, with the death of his father, you know, I really felt that power in there. And I just don't think that, you know, no matter what I did or how great I was, you know, next to the one in a million, you know, shut their lights out shot, which doesn't happen often, then it was going to be hard for me to win. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm i confident. You know, I need to be confident that nobody on planet Earth at 155 pounds can, for one, you know, number one, take those shots and two, walk through those shots and, you know, continue to pressure me and, and take me down, you know, and, and be that effective. So, um yeah, no, I had, you know, obviously as a competitor, I was not, not happy. You know, I got home and yeah, it was definitely, you know, a period where you got to, you know, sulk a little bit, but then really just bring your, pick yourself back up. You know, we do it two times a year and ultimately it was the biggest stage in the world, you know, for the, for the number one prize in the world. And you know, I was chasing, chasing something great. You know, I failed, but you know, that's definitely something unless you're Khabib, that you will experience on your way to greatness, I think. Amen to that. I, 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 I'm i sorry, Jim. I just, no, 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 I no. want to get into this, this matchup between Charles Oliveira and Dustin Poirier and just kind of your take on it, Justin, because I do think it's really interesting. Um, obviously you face Poirier, but, but just your thoughts on what might play out and then how you believe you match up against whoever gets their hand raised there with that title shot. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a very interesting matchup. I mean, I, I, I got a favorite Poirier, you know, def- most certainly. Uh, I don't know. Outside of the, you know, he's a great grappler. He's a great grappler, but again, he's not a great, he doesn't have the ability, the great ability to take you down to the ground. Um, you know, Poirier being a southpaw, it's always funky for when you face southpaws, a little bit different. You don't see him too often. Um, he does a great job at controlling range. You know, it's Oliveira's not Khabib. He doesn't march forward and march through things to, to close that distance. You know, he uh, 
he really needs you to either choose to take him down and then, or really he needs you to, to buy into the grappling with him and, you know, go into the clinch. And he has some good takedowns from the clinch. And I, I think that's the only time he takes people down is from the clinch. So I don't see Poirier being in the clinch a lot. Man, I'm, I'm not, I'm not high on, on Oliveira yet. And, you know, I get a lot of shit for it, but, you know, uh, he, you know, he's won eight in a row, but at the end of the day, Tony Ferguson was the best win on that streak by far. And, you know, it was after I put him through 24 minutes and 15 seconds of fucking of straight hell. And, you know, I didn't break him. He's not done. He can, the dude's, the dude's a special kind of dude. So he'll never be broken. But, you know, there's a certain way to fight that man. I showed you how to do it, you know, and again, that's so that win isn't as, as, as great as it was. And it wasn't as great as when I beat him, you know, when he was on his 12 fight win streak. You know, you after that, it, it's not as great. Um, and that's just what I think. Um, and outside that, he beat Nick Lentz. He beat, um, and, you know, if you could tell me anybody else on that eight fight win streak that he beat Kevin Lee. That was a good one. That was all right. Kevin Lee's a bitch. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Kevin. Uh, do, you, do you guys dislike each other or are you just saying that as Ooh. a matter of opinion? Yeah. I don't know. I think he's a bitch. When it comes to, I mean, he's got skills. You know, that, that knockout against Gillespie was the worst thing that could have happened to him because he doesn't knock people out. He needs to win a certain way. And that's by controlling, you know, everything, which is the grappling and getting it on the fence, getting it to the ground. So, yeah, I mean, I hate to. Yeah, he, I don't want to knock a guy when he's down. He just lost. He moved up weight classes. Like, it doesn't matter. Irrelevant. But I'll give you that. Nick Lentz, Kevin Lee. Who else? Let's see. Um, well, Jim Miller. I mean, uh, Jim Miller, uh, Clay Guida. Yeah. I mean, great fights, but not, you know, not championship caliber contender, yeah. con contender fights. Like, this just is what it is. Hey, he's got the belt. He could tell me to shove it. That's what I would be saying. Exactly what you said. I would tell him to shove up my ass. Go win eight in a row. <laughs> he can, you know, I'm in a great position. I don't have to win eight in a row. I got to win one in a row. So yeah. if he wins, um, then I'm going to, I would love to fight Charles Oliver because I will show you what I'm saying. He's a quitter. You know, he is a quitter. He's, he showed it to you in the Michael Chandler fight, you know, at the end of the set, at the end of the first round, he was not looking good. He, he didn't want to be there. He doesn't want to be there when it gets nasty. Um, and that, that's just what I think. That's my opinion. D did you feel too? Cause I think you, you and Poirier is going to beat him up. Okay. Yeah. And, and you and Michael uh, both kind of came in very, very well-respected fighters. You both came into the UFC with very high expectations. Uh, you both uh, won your first fight and then, and then dropped the, uh, the second one. And, and, and you've had a similar thing where you both kind of came in and you, you really are one of the, the favorite people for fans to watch fight i hope you realize that that, that even whether you've come off a win or a loss you're, you're one of the guys that people will watch fight anybody any any place yeah i definitely embrace it and i know i know that and I, I embrace that part that's why i got nine bonuses out of my first seven fights i mean that's why they pay me what they pay me this is an entertainment business you know i don't have the most entertaining personality but i love to go watch i go i love to go home and watch my fights so i already know yeah <laughs> You do have a great personality, sure. Justin, as somebody who well, gets yeah, to but, interview all the time. But you gotta have a you gotta have a personality where half hate you mm -hmm. and half love you. And yes. I have embraced the part. I don't want people to hate me, so I haven't everyone embraced loves it. you. Well, yeah. <laughs> but before we let you go, Justin, I just I need to ask about this commercial with that you did with Mike Chiesa because right. you guys are phenomenal in it, and I feel like. Justin Gaethje, the actor, really could be in the future because seriously, hey, you guys did such a tremendous how good job. An actor I am, Megan. After I fought Khabib, everyone thought in our interview that I was crying or something. That was me acting. I was like, oh my God, it's so sweet. Like, I was not, like, I was literally, and I went home, I was like, they didn't know I was joking. I'm a good, I, I mean, I'm not like, I'm, I'm probably as good an actor as I am a singer, which. I should keep punching people in the face. <laughs>
Well, you're a great fighter and a great uh, gardener. And an interesting thing I learned about you today. Um, but yeah, you're one of the most loved guys in the UFC. So your personality, whatever you're doing is working. Um, and uh, looking forward to this fight, man. I'm, I'm really happy for you that, you that you're getting this fight. And uh, I, I would like to see you get another shot at the title. Yes, sir. We are, what, about 50, 60 days? This is day 60, so I'm, I'm back to work. Great. I'm loving Got a, this is my first camp. I got a chef that's going to be coming to my house four nights a week, cooking dinner, snacks, and lunch the next day. I've never, like, followed a meal plan, um, so it's cool. It's cool. As I get older, I want to, I got, I have to do it because I'm older. You know, the body doesn't respond to anything like it used to. So, yeah, the the right choices will be made for 60 days straight, and I'll be great. I'll be my best anyways. All right. Can't wait. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. It's great talking to you as always. And uh, I can't wait to see you fight in November. We'll see you All soon. right. Have a great day. All right. Take see care ya. of yourself, man. Hey, sir. Hey, what's going on, guys? How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I, w I was reading, uh, again, we just talked to Gaethje who had been do doing criminal justice uh, a little bit in college and you were, uh, you wanted a law degree. I just, I, I think I read that right before and I'm fascinated. Yeah, no, I, uh, I graduated with poli sci and, um, from IU undergrad and then I went to law school as well. Um, oh, you did go. Yeah, yeah, I went as well, but I, I, uh, you know, as my dad told me when I graduated, he said, you can wipe your ass with a political science degree, son. So, I mean, it was kind of always, the plan to do it. And I think it's good to have that education. You know, I think that understanding the law is, is a very important thing. I want you to know, I have a political science degree here and then I got, a, my girl. I got a master's after it because I felt the same way. You gotta That's have some my, more education yeah, for this. You got to, you can't, you, you can't just show up and say, Hey, I got a poli sci degree, right? Bachelor right. arts, they need to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. But the law is, what kind of law did you uh, study? Cause I mean, for dealing with contracts and stuff, it certainly helps to under, have an understanding of the law when you're reading over contracts. Yeah. Your, your first year of law school is really your, 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 your meat and potatoes and you do contracts in your first year, you do torts, you do all that stuff. So I just, you know, I I've always had an interest in it. I thought it was interesting. Um, all the attorneys at my gym seem pretty fucking miserable half the time. So I think I did the right thing. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I never really wanted to be an attorney, you know, that's just not something that I wanted to do, but I just always had the vision of going to law school too, after, after doing political science for undergrad. So that's just what I did. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it is. It seems like a, it seems like the, the, you know, I, I wanted to be a lawyer after I saw Injustice for All with Pacino, but it was more the performance angle of standing in a yeah, court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't it's realize, like all, no, it's, it's all not, shit it's paperwork like, yeah, and emotions. Like yeah. And if you if you want to make money, uh, I mean, you're not doing criminal law. I mean, you're doing corporate law. You're doing all kinds of different law. And so that that whole show that you see law and order, that thing you have in your head, that's really just not how it is. And really, if you're doing that type of law, that's usually not a good sign. But anyways, I digress. Yeah. Well, it's working out for you on the coaching angle. Uh, safe. We had contender series last night and that's a show where your gym has done tremendously well. I mean, for you guys, what, what's the key to getting not just, you know, victories on contenders, but also just the opportunity to compete there and be good enough to be on the radar to get this, uh, you know, job interview. So we call it. Yeah. I think the UFC, you know, does a good job of recognizing talent. Uh, Sean Shelby and Mick Maynard are two, you know, unbelievably intelligent guys when it comes to MMA and no one ever talks about them. No one ever says anything, but these two guys are literal MMA geniuses. And I mean, it never ceases to amaze me when I see these fights every weekend, how unreal the matchups are. I mean, it, the, the, the explosion of violence, it just keeps coming, you know? And so those guys, I think they recognize a gym who's producing talent and they go to those gyms and we've been lucky enough to kind of have our whole rise come to a contender. You know, we've had uh, um, 11 wins in the contender, I think, or something like that. And, yeah, I think eight uh, contracts. Yeah, eight contracts, more contracts than any other gym. And so for us, it's kind of like just part of the process now. And I actually prefer taking my guys that way because I think it just gives them one extra, you know, uh, experience to get in the octagon and, and see what it feels like before they get in there um, in the UFC. What's the preparation difference? Like if, if a contender, there's so much less tape 
on an opponent and there might be a lot less uh, knowledge about how they fight. I mean, obviously, if you're if you're helping Ryan against, uh, you know, Anthony Smith, there's a lot of footage on Anthony Smith. So what, what do you do when you're preparing somebody who there's just not a lot of material on? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the reality is the contender we look at as a one to two round fight. Um, you know, you should be going in there and smashing whoever you're fighting. And then that means they, they need to go back to the regional level and you're ready to go to the next level. Cause it's supposed to be the best regional fighters, uh, available on LFA and so on. So we really look at it as, as, uh, we do a different, a little bit of different training. We, we tell people like, you know, this is kill, kill, kill. Like you need to win in the first round. And I know the contenders, you know, I think there were some, some distance fights and people are complaining about, you know, well, they're, these guys are getting signed and listen, in the end of the day, they know who they need and they know who they don't need. And uh, they don't need anybody. Uh, people are going to watch UFC every week, no matter what, no matter who the hell's fighting. That's been proven now during COVID. So you got to stand out in the contender and you've really got to go lay it all on the line. And I think you've seen when guys don't do that, they don't make it. Even if they do it and lose, they get a chance to come back. So really the show is just about just going all out. It's actually almost harder than a UFC fight because a UFC fight, you're just trying to win. You know, you maybe right. you gotta lay in, maybe you gotta lay in praying the second and the third. Maybe you you know you you've out you've damaged a guy, you know, and you gotta move, whatever. And the contender, if you show that and you know hesitation uh, even if you're winning you're not going to get signed which i think you know i think it makes sense you got to show that you're ready to go in there and throw down yeah um for you as a coach obviously every day is different right especially with all the different athletes that are at your gym but does it keep things you know interesting and creative and and for you you know these different game plans when you have contenders all these guys fighting on contenders then you've got a main event like ryan span then you've got alex morono who's taking a you know short notice fight it's always kind of all over the place and very very different yeah well i mean i I wouldn't say that it's uh that that's always a pleasant experience i'd say it's a rather (laughs) stressful experience because each one of them requires it you know a different prism to really accomplish the goal you know and you know like you 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 were saying earlier about anthony smith right the guy's been in there you know um, he's got tons of experience you know uh that's a different fight for ryan a a, a 25 minute fight anthony's going to try to put the experience on him i mean we already we we don't understand the dynamics a contender fight goes back to what you know we were just previously speaking about so it is totally different it's not like you can have the same approach and say hey somebody you know do this 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 and you're ready to fight every fight is different you know alex morono we did the game plan in vegas we you know we had what two days to prepare while he was cutting weight. And, and I mean, God bless that kid. He's, he nailed that game plan and he's done that twice. He did it with cowboy too. So you build a confidence when you're fighters too. And, and you, sometimes you don't need as much prep time with certain athletes who have a lot of experience. What, what do you think makes a shitty coach? Because it really is. It, it's not just being a good fighter, but what, what is it that will, and it doesn't have to be a, a person you name, but what oh, do you no, think would, goes, what do you think goes into making somebody like, what is a quality somebody has where you're like, that person is going to be a shitty co- uh, coach? Well, I, I, let me speak about what makes a good coach. Okay. Um, and and, and the, in the spirit of being a coach, which is being positive and, and, and being productive. I think the most important thing is a coach needs to be ready to be all about everybody else. I mean, truly ready to sacrifice their health, their time, the time with their family. Um, and a lot of other things, because to really, truly coach, you've got to give everything you have. And I mean, I've tried it every different way and I'm telling you, that's the only way. And some people are still, you know, maybe they're still feeling themselves or, you know, they, they're going through a different phase in life. I'd say that I really, I don't know, you know, I don't, would never name another coach. I think coaches have to carry themselves with a lot more class. I think it's silly when coaches act dumb. You don't see coaches in the NFL fucking running around you know, on Instagram posts and stuff like clowns. I think, I, I think it's pretty embarrassing actually, because yeah. I think everybody's looking at our sport and as a head coach, I think you're representing your team, you, you know, your gym, your brand, you know, uh, I made Fortis, I created it. Uh, I don't work for someone else. I didn't, you know, I'm not coaching at someone's gym. Who's an owner. I own the gym, you know, Darren owns 10% of the gym. He came in at the very end. So for me, I'm representing my whole vision. So I don't know. I, I just think it's really kind of a class thing. And um, I think you've got to be ready to sacrifice everything for your athlete to win. That's my, my biggest takeaway. And 
you can kind of tell when people aren't ready to do that. Are you out at the bar, you know, uh, drinking when your guy lost, you know, um, actions speak everything. You know, I mean, when we lose a fight, I'm depressed for fucking two weeks about that, you know, and I mean, uh, it never, it never leaves either. You know, even after we win, I go back and think about, well, we lost that one fight, you know, and uh, it, l- losing should bother you so bad that you don't really have time for anything else. And that's just kind of how I feel about it. And I guess you got to almost too. you're dealing with different personalities of different fighters too. So I'm sure that uh, with each, you have to be yourself, but I'm sure you have to be somewhat pliable to the personality of the, of the guy you're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, I try not. To, I try to give every athlete the attention that they need to perform the best they can. You know, my whole goal is for them to win. If if one guy I tell him, "Hey, go do jumping jacks in the parking lot," you know, and sing karaoke, and he wins every fight, guess what? We're doing that every single <laughs> damn fight. I don't give a shit about. It's not about me fulfilling what I think. Like I analyze the situation. If a guy comes in and I have a plan for him, and I can see that he's dog tired, you know, maybe something's not going on well at home whatever i'll be like you know what man let's have fun today like i will change it up however i need to for that athlete because this job is so hard to fight in the ufc it requires so much attention skill work discipline that it's a really a delicate dance to try to land that planes right on the runway fight week and peak you know and um it, it's something you've got to constantly be engaged about so you're right i mean every day is a different day and i think that makes uh um uh, you know, students and athletes and fighters feel better when they know that their coach understands them and understands what they're thinking and feeling. And I think that's really important when you're cornering, because if you're cornering someone and you can't read them because you don't know them, you're going to have a problem because you're not going to give them the information that they need. Is there for you a moment in your coaching career that really stands out because you, you've you've got so many big wins as a head coach? I mean, is there one that's like that was particularly sweet because... You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of crazy moments. I mean, when, you know, I love Frank Camacho, so I love this guy and I hate bringing up this knockout when Jeff knocked him out, but we were in Dallas and we were at home and our whole team was there. Our whole gym was there. Everybody in Dallas was there. And it was when Fortis was really just starting to take off and for him to land that kick and, and we planned that, you know, and, um, in front of everybody, 20,000 people. I mean, that was obviously cool. Uriah fighting Anderson. I mean, I don't give a shit what anyone says. You're looking at it. I'm sitting there. And I was like, yeah, you know what? It's cool. I'll see Anderson this week. I'm like, whatever. It's not a big deal. You know, I'm like, mm. I saw him at the, at the hotel. I was like, oh, damn, we're fighting Anderson this week. I mean, and I'm sitting there looking across the cage and there's Anderson Silva just looking. And it's not about that. When you've been doing MMA full time since 2005, I've been doing this full time. You know, I mean, you, you, you pay your dues and you have a little bit of a different lens. So I never, ever like to post knockouts or talk about, I can't fucking stand coaches or, oh, we knocked this guy out, blah, blah, blah. Well, you didn't fucking do anything. You didn't knock anybody out. Your ass was sitting in the seat. And uh, it's usually people that haven't fought that talk a lot of shit. So I I never want to talk about, oh, we crushed this guy or that guy. Honestly, after we win, I just move on. Um, I don't, you know, I exit out. I'm done. And that opponent goes away. All the research that I have opened up on my phone, everything I'm looking at all just disappears and it's nothing but respect, you know, and, and we move on. And how much time do you spend a day actually doing the research? Do you, do you, is it something you like doing or is that an aspect of it? You, you like less. It's a, it's a necessary um, step in, in a fight camp. And I think anyone that doesn't watch film is just, is just a jackass. I mean, to, 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 to say, ah, oh, you know what, we're just going to do us. And uh, you know, it is, uh, we're not worried about what he does. I mean, who goes into a war and doesn't plan? only an idiot would do something like that. So, uh, yeah, I study a ton. I study everything. I study their social media. I study all of it, you know, and, uh, I think if you can get any kind of insight, um, on your opponent, you should. And I think everybody does that now, you know, I think we're all so interconnected, um, that I think it, it, you know, it's out there, but we don't post a lot. We don't do open practice. We don't do any of that stuff because I got that old football coach mindset, man, you know, practice is private dude it's work time so uh some guys will post a lot of stuff some guys will post their even their sparring rounds so it's like man if you want to give me all that all that default information what you do in your inside your gym you know I'm, I'm gonna look at it when you um when you talk about insight and you know you're doing research and you're working with these guys and you know them so intimately 
Is it ever hard for you? Because as, as we're all well aware on this, on this chat, um, there are often many things the public doesn't know for someone going into oh, yeah. a fight, you uh, know, and that can be so challenging, whether it's a physical uh, ailment, but emotionally, mentally, whatever so it may true. be, how, how hard is it for you? You know, because oftentimes you want to defend that person, right? I oh, even yeah. with my own husband, oh, I feel that yeah. way. So, uh, I mean, I'm, th I'm thinking about Joe right now while you're saying this, because I completely understand. And you have an insight on this that most people will never understand, but your insight is, is just as connected, if not more in the sense that that's your husband. And we know you love that man. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, so yours is super personal. And I guess that I have so many of them that it's, it's the same type of thing. But what I would tell you is, you know, I will say this and I don't like to bring up race, but the DMs and stuff that these guys get, that these little shits feel like firing away, like, and, and Ryan Spann got one, um, one that was so bad and it was so racist and it was so cruel and we walked into the hotel and he turned around and he goes i'll never forget this he looks at me and he shows me the phone and he goes he goes how do these people have the nerve to act like this coach he goes i really don't understand and he said it in such a calm way and i said ryan I, i'm sorry man he goes he goes it's just a shame he goes it's a shame people act this way coach he said it's terrible and i said you're right for a guy to lose to go out there and, and fucking lose in front of everybody your friends are watching your family's watching everybody's watching and you we all know what's on the line we all know how much fighters identify with their wins and losses and who, who they are as human beings and how they feel and how they value themselves we all value ourselves megan you're great at your job if if everyone was like you fucking suck it would it would bother you so much even if oh, you yeah. try to ignore it Right. I mean, we all say, oh, we, I don't care what anyone else says, but we do. We're human beings, you know, and and humans like praise and they don't need a lot of it. Some of them, but they don't need to be DM'd on their phone specifically right after they fight a picture of them or 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 a racist comment or a rude comment. Like it's sad, man. And I really I would love to see the MMA community and the MMA fan base pick up these athletes, you know, uh, revere them, love them, support them, push them, help them, um, you know, be fans, you know, again, like football. I mean, look at the Buffalo Bills organization. They do all that cool stuff for all that. Like, why can't we take this to a higher level? Because I, it's so disgusting to me and low level, to be honest, when I see it, I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I've had those moments several times where I tell myself, why am I engaged in such this, this low level activity? Like, this isn't what I'm about. I'm about competition. I'm about winning. I'm about discipline and sports and all the same great stuff. But the fan base is so polluted and toxic sometimes. It's just like, why would you want to even be a part of that? So there's a lot goes into that. We talk about it a lot. You know, our thing is we don't respond. I'm not going to write anybody who writes me or say anything. I Sorry. mean, that's, that's what they, that's their everything. And it's just sad that we can't see people pushing these guys up and girls up and telling them, you know, you got so much courage. When I fought, people were telling me, like, you are so unbelievably courageous. And I was only 3 and L pro. People were like, man, they're like, it takes so much courage to do what you do. Because you know this, back in the day, people respected the hell out of fighting MMA. And somewhere it's changed. And you've got these guys that are fighting the highest level in front of millions of eyes. Man, dude, give people a break, you know. So I can go on and on about this one, you, you know. So we'll just leave that there. No, I... I Oh, sorry, Jim. Oh, no, I know. No. I, I love what you said. And I, I would agree um, from my role in the company or, you know, being a wife to an athlete that there are times where it's like, okay, I just I'm peace out. I can't do this. Yeah. My mental health it's, is not worth this, I but I, I've become a big fan of the report button on social media. So whenever those messages come in or I see tweets, even if they have nothing yeah. to do with me or whoever, and they're directed towards an athlete, I'm reporting them for harassment. God, because you yeah, know what? God bless you. You don't have that. Uh, you don't have no. that right to to try and pull somebody down and and want to see their life collapse. You're behind like an emoji. You know what I mean? Like you're it, no, it, you don't even it, have a real photo. I, I, I mean, I agree with you so much, and it it really is disgusting, and it it it's something that that really speaks to just where some of these people are at in their own hearts. And you know, we'll just leave it at that. But you know, I'm a happy guy. We're living the dream. All of us right now are living yeah. the dream. My guys are living the dream. Girls are living the dream fighting the UFC. And we just try to stay positive.
Amen. You know what I've I've stopped doing because I'm I'm going to guess the guy that sent Ryan that awful message did it a under a fake name and uh, it's probably no, safe. No, that's the worst part. That's the worst part. What? He sent it from his fucking normal account, normal name. Some fucking kid who's like Ryan Spam is six foot five of fucking badass. You know, like it, it's just this mindset. And he told me he goes, Coach, this is this guy's. And I said, Ryan, wow. your phone and set it down. Yeah, I mean. We're talking about these kids now because they think like, well, you're not going to fly here and do some shit to me, you know, uh, like Deontay Wilder that beat that dude's ass a few years ago. You YouTube that he went and beat some kid's ass that some, some something similar. We can't engage in that behavior. Sure, we're not going to. But it it just sad to me that a sport that is growing faster than any other sport in the world that is the hardest thing to do out of anything. I I don't give a shit what anyone says. Come try it. Um, is just denigrated so badly with its fan base and, and the athletes are abused and, and, and ridiculed and, and talked about and, and, and why, why, you know, like, man, we all know what, when you walk in that cage and that door shuts and they bolt you in, you're laying it on the line and you deserve respect no matter what. I don't give a shit if you run away half the fight, if you lose, if you slip on a banana peel and get knocked out in 10 seconds, like God bless you for getting in there. So it's just one of those things. I don't know. I guess being a part of it for so long and being on the inside, it really, it, it, it does irk me. Do you, have you ever thought of taking, like a lot of times I won't uh, list my, I won't look at my at mentions or read comments, which is kind of hard to do. Uh, but I always think the comments, like this is not, a communicative thing like I don't need it like when you watch yeah, a yeah. movie yeah. nobody wants to hear assholes talking in the theater yeah. so like yeah. why even read I try not to, sometimes I won't read my app mentions at all even the good ones yeah. I don't need to see well you're you're a gangster and you've been doing this a little longer than some of us right no you've I'm just I'm just more hated I'm just used no, to being hated no, no, no. <laughs> you're, you're in the entertainment you understand you like you understand it and you know Joe Rogan says that well I don't read the comments it's like Dude, man, nobody sets out in life, you know, wanting to get uh, abused and messaged and like, it's just not cool, man. Right. So it's like, yeah, block people or I think that's great. You know, don't read it or, or whatever. When I'm done with MMA, I will be completely off of social media. I will take my phone and throw it in the fucking creek right over here. And, uh, <laughs> and you want to talk to me, write me a letter, come stop by. We're going back to the eighties. So that's how I feel about it. I think that's perfect. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm looking. Obviously, we're looking forward to the uh, to the fight. And uh, you're a fascinating guy. I, I really am fascinated with coaches because what you guys do, the things you see um, when watching people fight. And again, I, fighters, obviously, ex-fighters will see it when you listen to DC or Dominic Cruz when they're analyzing oh, a fight. Yeah. The, the, the things you guys catch in movement. And the best example I can think of, and I've used this before, was uh, Jones's team saying that they were they knew in in from watching tape that Cormier dipped a certain way during yeah. something, and it was I think that head kick with the uh, with the leg in the uh, I think it was a yeah, second yeah, the, fight. He dips one way every time. God bless DC. He's got a, he's such a G. He, he'll bring that up, right? He'll be like, I know because I I fucking dipped that way and I got <laughs> caught with it, which it's so lovable that he he brings it up himself. Which you know, again, no one gives these guys credit, even the announcers. You know, all these guys that have laid it on the line. You know, I always see Bisbing going after people and I always want to tell him, Bisbing, man, you're the champ, dude. Like, yeah. you don't need to engage in any of that. But what I'll tell you about Greg Jackson, who is my coach, he's one of the greatest coaches that ever lived. And uh, and uh, hopefully one day maybe, he, you know, that's recognized. But Greg is unbelievably smart. And my time with him as a fighter definitely shaped a lot of the things that I do in coaching. And I'm, and I'm forever grateful for that. And that era at Jackson's was historic and, uh, you know, deserves respect and Greg deserves a ton of respect. And, and I know how much and how hard they worked and it doesn't surprise me that they, that they saw that. And two of the kindest people to ever see at events, you and Greg, you both go yeah. out of your way to say hello and to thank employees that most people just kind of breeze past. And it's always truly such a pleasure to work shows well, with you when you have guys on the I, card. I, I appreciate it. And I, and I will leave this, this one story with Greg. You know, I remember people were saying, oh, he's greedy and like all this shit. Oh, he just wants people to win again. Well, Greg is the fucking nicest guy. He's allergic to money, Greg. You try to pay him. He's like, no, 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 no. He's like, oh, come on. I gave Greg an Xbox 360. Obviously, this was a long time ago because I was trying to hook him up. I just got done fighting and I wanted to take care of him, you know, and I, every time I did anything for him and Wink even, 
they would always be like, no, 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 no. I would have to throw Winkle John. I'd have to throw the money in his glove box in his truck while he was inside the gym. Greg, I would, you know, figure out ways to pay him or I just, you know, just get him on the spot. So I sit here and I, you know, and, and this was in 2006 and seven. And I hear people talk about these guys now, these, these guys as their older statesmen and coaches that, you know, maybe are, you know, going to dip as we all will dip when, you know, at some point in our career. And uh, it really bothers me because they don't know how many lives they've affected and how many people they've helped and how much those guys did for MMA. I'm a product of that. And then my team is a product of that. And all my fighters are a product of that. And it goes back to that martial arts lineage, you know, your coach and your sensei and your teacher. And I just, I would love to just see a lot more respect get brought back in the game. And, and uh, that's just kind of how our team does things. And that's how we're going to continue to do it. I love it. Yes, thank you so much. And again, I'm sorry as you're talking. I'm je- I, I, yeah, I'm I'm looking out my window at them working, and and they put very heavy weights on something that's going to collapse, and I'm trying to keep something from collapsing. So I don't want you to think I'm freaking out as you're talking. Uh, I'm we- I'm trying to sing. To these well, you're worried. You're starting to fucking worry me a little bit. So I just want to make sure you're all right. I mean, I'm good, man. I apologize. I, I was listening to you, but I'm just I see them doing something, and it's like watching a movie of my fucking terrace about to be destroyed. So uh, I have to tell these guys to take the weight off something. So I apologize, but. Again, you're a fascinating yeah. guy, and I, I love appreciate you. it. Handle your business, and if you need me, press the red button, and I'll I'll fly over there and <laughs> and do whatever I need to do. Thanks. Matthew. I believe it too. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Abe. Take care of right, yourself. Guys. All right, Take be care. good. Today, I am wearing my Derek Jeter jersey because he's being inducted into the Hall of Fame today. He deserves it. Um, was his unanimous or no? I always there was the, one. I'm always no. one. One asshole. Um, I think Mariana Rivera was the first one to be unanimous, right? Yeah, I. Um, well, you can't see it, but I have some things from his Hall of Fame induction. My dad went, um, and he was unanimous. So I have a, a, a little T-shirt and brochures and programs and stuff. Mariano was one of the greatest players that's ever lived. Yeah, even though he would always make me nervous, and I thought that uh, Joe Torre at times brought him in too early, one out in the eighth inning. And I thought that burned him a little bit, but uh, it really frustrates me that Jeter was not unanimous. It, it, that makes you kind of dislike sports writers. It's like, it's not about you guys. I mean, the guy showed up clutch every single time he yep. needed to, from the time he was a rookie on. So the fact that somebody, they just, you know what it is? They wanted the attention. They wanted to be the guy that, that didn't vote. Yes. You know, yeah. they wanted a little bit of that notoriety because there's really not a reason to not vote for Derek Jeter, unanimous first ballot hall of famer, but today he goes into Cooperstown. Good for him. And this, this is obviously <laughs> his first ballot. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I can't think of a Yankee that I would, I would say is more of And I don't watch baseball anymore. Uh, but I literally can't think of a, a Yankee that I would start the team with before him if I had. And I mean, historically, sure. everyone that's ever played for the Yankees, I think I would take him because he just had a, uh, there was something about him um, that they just won. He was just a great team leader. and Yeah, uh, that's what it was, I think, elevating everyone around him to success as well. Was he the next captain? I, 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 I'm, I'm, you might be too young to remember when Thurman Munson died. Oh, uh, but, yeah. I think Thurman was the captain, and then it was uh, was Jeter the next Yankee captain, or Mattingly was Mattingly a captain? I think Don Mattingly was a captain, but Derek Jeter for sure was captain as well. Yeah. All right. You know, this is for people who hate baseball. This is just really weird <laughs> baseball talk. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Um, I know we're supposed to wrap up, but did you watch the fights on Saturday? I did. Yeah. Oh boy, did I? Uh, let me go over and see which fights we have. But then you, you uh, apparently called the main event correctly. Well, you you picked Brunson. Decision. As yeah, right. I picked. By, but people don't. I mean, no one is disrespecting Brunson, but I, I don't know how people are looking past Derek Brunson every time. Um, those guys, uh, after you know, beating Shabazi and, and again, who is this? What was he eleven and zero when he lost? The, these guys, they forget that a guy like Brunson has seen everything. Yep. There's nothing you can do, you know, and again, Adesanya, I mean, you know, knocked him out, which I knew he had power, but I don't think anything proved his power more than knocking out Derek Brunson like that. I love Derek Brunson, though. He's one of my favorite guys to watch. Yeah, and I would love to see that matchup again now that Derek is training full-time at Sanford MMA. I think it could be yeah. uh, really intriguing. He said he he would maybe be open to fighting Jared Cannonier before a potential title shot. So I do think that'd be a very cool matchup. And um, and then you could say there's really a deserving number one contender after this next title fight. Yes, and uh, he's isn't he, I want to say he's 5-0 and oh since going to Sanford. Am I correct? Yes, Blonde Brunson. Yes, with oh, yeah. blonde hair as well. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, but he's uh, he's a guy that people constantly pick against, uh, and I don't mean Matt. I mean not just us making our dumb little picks. But I'm I'm fascinated that people don't give him. I think the uh respect that he deserves and Usman even you know a guy like Usman um d- doesn't get the credit that he deserves it's, you know who, who else do they overlook Olivera I didn't agree with Gaethje I thought Olivera is is a, is a tremendously underrated fighter yeah no I would agree with you and I I think no matter who Gaethje fights if he gets past Michael Chandler will be an intriguing matchup whether it is Poirier or Olivera but now with a little bit of heat and the sort of evolution we've seen in Olivera I, I would love to see that matchup as well I would too. Um, Gaethje against anyone, uh, I, I'll watch. But that, you know, this is the thing about the UFC. There's so many great fights. There's never a shitty card. And how nice was it? Uh, uh, Aspinall looked incredible against oh. uh, 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 Spivak, and uh, uh, I was very happy for Patty Pimblett, who I uh, who, who uh, Luigi looked actually pretty good in the first round. He did. And uh, he said to us, that he I don't think he makes it out of the first round. He said that to us when he, we had him on, Patty, and he was correct. Yeah, he was very confident all week long when we spoke to him. I think um, that was a big coming out party for him. Yeah. You know, uh, I think that the British fighters had a great night. We saw Molly McCann yeah. get back into the win column. You mentioned Tom. Big win, big potential for the future of heavyweight with a guy like Tom Aspinall. And then Patty, he just sort of knows how to work that microphone as well, which is half the battle. You're right, Luigi looked very strong in the beginning there, um, but he came back and got it done. So it'd be interesting to see who they they match him up with next and sort of how his career trajectory goes. But he does not shy away from the public speaking aspect of it, which is no. sometimes half the battle when you're a new up and coming fighter. So we'll, I, you know, I think we're all interested to see what happens with him in his next matchup. And, and before we go, Tom Aspinall, one thing I noticed too, um, was he talks about like, well, I have to work my way up before. I think he said it in the post fight or, or in the, uh, in the, you know, in the cage, if I'm a uh, 13th, give me 12. There's something about that. Now I, I like the humility of not expecting Cyril Ghan or Derek Lewis or Ngannou, you have to your first UFC fighter. But is he doubting himself a little bit? It was an odd thing to hear a fighter say and then reiterate. Again, not that you're unreasonable and want the number two guy right now, but there was something about it that just stuck with me. I went, eh, does he not believe in himself? Or I, I don't know, maybe he's just extraordinarily humble. I think he's very humble. I think he knows he's relatively new to the sport and a higher level of competition. And one thing that kind of stood out to me was, was that he felt like for this fight, it was the first time he had a proper camp with proper training partners. He actually had heavyweights this time where in reality, he's training with, you know, guys who are much, much smaller than him and not just weight, but also stature. So he didn't ever feel fully prepared heading into the octagon because he wasn't getting the real feel of a heavyweight until He was in competition. So I think that has a little bit to do with it as well. Like maybe I can do a few more camps, like a real heavyweight before I get into that title talk sort of picture. And I think, I think it's smart because sometimes we do see people be derailed when they're on, you know, a good winning streak or they've got all of this potential because they take big fights too soon. And I think he's just trying to make the most of it and really sort of fine tune and mold that uh, fight camp that he knows he needs to really get to that next level, that top 10, that top five of the division. And what do you think in uh, again, and, and him and uh, Cyril Ghan, I guess that has not been booked. Um, but he he's it's odd decisions they're making. Um, like I understand you want to take a victory lap and he's a great and everybody loves this guy, but you know, and eh, he's not, is he enjoying being the champ too much? I'm sure he's training, but I think sometimes guys enjoy being the champion too much too soon. And that, that, that worries me again, maybe just, I shouldn't, but that worries me a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I can tell you that I see Francis at extreme couture all the time, putting in the work. So yeah. I, I had heard, he said he'd be ready in September. So it'll be, okay. I think interesting to see when that fight actually gets booked for and, and how you manage not overworking and not peaking, you know, before you have to get into camp and then managing your camp correctly. So I do think everybody's just kind of waiting with bated breath to find out, okay, when exactly do we get to see this title unification bout? Because that Cyril and Derek Lewis fight was, was so talked about. And now we, we want to keep that going, you know, and then, and then in the balance hangs steep Bay as well. Like what's, well, where's he going next? Where, you know, so I think we forget about him sometimes, but I think he's waiting for this title fight to be matched up as well. Yeah, and I think, is he saying he wouldn't take another fight unless it's Ngannou or, or the champion, whoever the champion is? 
I believe so. But, you know, I think things can always change depending on the, the landscape of a weight class or, you know, family situation. He just had a baby. So I think he wants some time to be with his family as well, baby Mateo. So, um, you know, a, a lot of moving parts in that division. And it all starts with this title unification bout. What do you think about Nganu, uh, Cyril Gunn? I would still take Francis over him. I know a lot of people said they would take Cyril. Uh, but I think I think I took uh, Derek Lewis over Gunn, too. I think so. I, obviously, I pick a lot of fights wrong. Uh, but I would take Francis over. Because uh, I think they match up in reach. Don't they match up in reach? Um, I'm not positive. But I, I mean, the thing that is a big storyline is the fact that they were old training partners. And, and Cyril uses, you know, Francis's old camp there in Paris. And what can be gained from that? I think the power of Francis Ngannou can never be denied and is always that X factor that will elevate him to a different level. But the matchup could be very intriguing, especially Cyril, Cyril doesn't really care about maybe having these like crazy exciting fights. He just cares about the win and doing so methodically and with a game plan and sticking to it. And I think that is a, uh, that is, is a factor when you go against Francis and Ganu to see, well, can you really have that game plan against a guy like Francis? I don't know. So I think that's why we'll watch. Yeah. I mean, he obviously moves a lot better than Rosenstrike, but when you look at Francis Rosenstrike, like he, he, it, they weren't the smoothest punches. Francis just kind of went in throwing bombs and there's, you just can't take one of those. Exactly. So if he, if he lands one, you're finished. And you wonder if he would approach Cyril the same way, or if Cyril is fast enough left and right to get out of his way. But yeah, that, that is why we watch. That's a fight that, uh, that would be the fight I could probably look forward to more than anything. I think would be that fight. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. We've got a lot of fun ones coming up. So I'm really particularly hyped for this msg show though uh, me too i hope i can go to it too i hope i'm not doing some shitty gig somewhere in you know <laughs> you know dayton ohio uh but yeah you're great thank you for coming on i, I really love Thanks when you're on me. and i know matt does too so uh you're, you're fun to watch and uh thank, thank you so you. much for coming on with us today you're the best i appreciate it jim okay we'll talk to you soon all right see ya all right bye everybody and thanks to justin gaethje and safe sayud take care